a lot of people tell me I live in the future. Um, I like that. It's kind of fun. I never look backwards. But the future is coming at us faster and faster. And I want to walk you into my world. Now, I'm a little hard to define. I'm part scientist, part businessman, part really um, tinkerer. I've pulled everything apart that I've ever owned. See how it works? With the exception of the cat. <laughs> I usually describe myself as a cell biologist, and I want to introduce you to my little friends. Because we're all used to our cell phones, but these cells, which are the, really the foundation of every living thing on this planet, are really unknown to most people. And that's because they're microscopic. We didn't even know they existed until about 400 years ago. And as you can see, they're doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things going on in these cells. They're manufacturing proteins and lipids and organizing, copying DNA, and separating the chromosomes as the cells divide. These are the most powerful little factories on the planet. These can make thousands of different compounds. These have been around for four billion years in an unbroken chain of life that continues to branch out and create new forms. Cell biology is absolutely beautiful and it's addicting if you start looking under a microscope at these little organisms, whether they be bacteria, single cells, or eukaryotic cells like the cells that make us. Cells are so complex. Cells are so mysterious. Remember, we've only known about them for 400 years, and we haven't had great tools to look at them. We still ascribe their creation to deities. We still look at, we, we, we say to scientists, if they try and monkey with this cell, that they are playing God. It's remarkable, and yet, these cells are everywhere. We have 50 trillion cells in our own body, and scientists tell us we may have 10 times more bacterial cells in and on us. Cells are everywhere. Now, we've been deconvoluting the wiring of cells for as long as we've known about them. We've started to map the biochemistry. And it's all tangled. It's like, it's like trying to untangle the ingredients in a bubbling pot of soup. But we're getting pretty good at it because we're learning how to share information and record it in computers. This is that wiring deconvoluted. This is really the wiring diagram of a eukaryotic cell. This is from a, from a database. It's the overview, the high-level overview. And it's really the sum total of thousands of scientists working decades putting all this together. Now, you can drill into this database. Here, I'm just going into one particular sugar pathway that generates different molecules. And you can start to see every compound, every chemical that's made, and every enzyme catalyzing every reaction. This is a remarkable data asset, and it's available to everyone. And this is really, again, it's like looking at a complex wiring diagram of, an, of a computer chip or a car. But more than that, we can actually go down into the code, the genetic code, that makes all of these reactions, all this biochemistry, all this magic. And that's because of this project that was started, conceived in the 1980s, a long time ago. Started formally in 1990, First draft completed in 2000, and all the T's crossed, and, and essentially the project wrapped up in 2003. That's a long time ago, 14 years since this wrapped up. But it hasn't really stopped. It just keeps, it was just really the starting point for what we know with genomics. The Human Genome Project was successful because of the promise of sequencing the human genome. The scientists said, look, it's going to be expensive. We figure it'll cost about $3 billion. We figure it'll take 15 years. 
But if we can read the code of a human being, we'll know more about cancer, we'll know more about health, we'll, we'll just, what, what could be more powerful than understanding the program that makes people? Most of us have never looked at this data. Now we end up with technology that is accelerating to generate this type of data. The first genome was $3 billion, the second one was about $100 million, and I just had my genome sequenced a few months ago for under $1,000. There's, there's been very few technologies, and this may be the only technology that has ever decreased in price and increased in performance so fast that most of us don't use, know about, or care about. This is remarkable. But things are shifting. We're not just reading genomes anymore, which today is informing things like our cancer treatments, telling us what microbes are in the environment, allowing us to really understand their food crops, etc. Now we have, been, have got tools to actually start writing genomes. And I don't mean modifying genomes. Modifying genomes the way it used to be done. Remember, we've been doing genetic engineering since the 1970s. Modifying genomes is really just flipping a couple of bits here and there, reorganizing a few things, adding in one new trait or ability, maybe a few. I'm talking we actually have tools now that allow us to take electronic data, electronic code, and turn it into genetic code to actually write DNA. This gives us the ability to program cells, to program them from scratch, with intention, with atomic control. This is really powerful stuff, and I've been exploring this field ever since 2003, when we wrapped up the genome. It's what led me to this company, Autodesk. Autodesk makes design software, ones and zeros. We don't actually make physical products. We make design tools, and that's because to make complex things like cars or buildings or cities, or to do visualization and simulation that is photorealistic, like we use for movies, you need really, really powerful software tools. Design tools, simulation tools. And I knew that if, if it takes these types of tools to go and design a car, or a new phone, we're definitely going to need this type of tool to design a metabolic pathway or to design a cell, even a simple one. I was really fortunate that in 2009 I got to meet the CEO and CTO of Autodesk at a, at a function. And I said to them, I love what your tools do, but you only make dead stuff. Do you want to make living things too? And instead of running, they said, yeah, that sounds really cool. Let's look into that. And they looked into it for almost three years, and then they founded a life science group to do exactly that. And I joined that group right away. And while I was waiting for my HR paperwork to process, I was sitting in New York. I was thinking about the future, and I thought, man, it's time for another genome project. We need big thinking again, because since 2003, when the last one wrapped up, there was just dead silence about what we were going to do next. We'd gone into the world of omics. But what are omics? It's just other data sciences. And I thought, what if we, what if, isn't it time for another genome project where now we write a human genome rather than just read it? What, what, possibilities could open up if we did that. And I don't mean, and I'll say this right now, make synthetic babies. I'm saying write the three billion base pairs of human genetic code accurately, properly, put it into a cell and demonstrate that it works, runs the cell and allows the cells to divide. Nothing happened after I wrote that article. It was kind of dead air. That was 2012. But in 2015, shortly after I had just done this orientation at the White House about inspiring inventors to go out and invent, 
I end up at a meeting for something called the Synthetic Yeast Project. And this is actually the most sophisticated genetic engineering project on the planet. They're synthesizing a yeast genome, which is about 12 million base pairs of code. And it's pretty cool. 16 chromosomes. Yeast are more like us than they are like bacteria. And then the project was going well, and I said, well, what do you want to do next? And they asked me, what do you want to do next? And I said, I, I think you should do the human genome. Wrong audience. It was like, <laughs> but I noticed something. All the old people were kind of looking frightened, and all the young people were like, oh, because the first genome project ignited my career. They saw the potential that this could just open doors. So I felt I had to push the boundaries because, again, I had this new ambassador position to go and push people. So I called up these two scientists. I called up George Church. He's famous in genetics, super open, great sense of humor, open mind, you know, just love the guy. And I said, George, you were part of the first genome project. I nominate you to be the leader of the next genome project, to write a human genome. And it took about 30 minutes on a phone call to forget him to, for him to say yes. But he had one condition. He said, the leader of the yeast genome project that's doing all this amazing genetic engineering needs to be a part of it. That guy's name is Dr. Jeff Buka. And Jeff is at NYU, and he's kind of the polar opposite of George. He's, he's really quiet and thoughtful and really, really thinks about things a long time. And he wasn't so sure that this was a good idea and that he wanted to attach his name to it. But he did, after three months of thinking about it. He saw the value. And I have to hand it to Nancy Kelly, a close friend that is a lawyer and is really good at putting scientists together and working with them for, for bringing Jeff in. And together we formed a, a little team of people that created a nucleus for the Next Genome Project. Two world-class scientists, one crazy catalyst, and a lawyer that could do all the paperwork and manage a complex pro project. So we just needed one more thing, money. You always need money to do anything. So I went to see this guy. This is Carl Bass. And Carl was the CEO of Autodesk at the time. And as you can see, he's a pretty casual guy. This is his workwear. And he's a maker. And I, I said, Carl, I, you know I like to chase cars. I, I think I caught a train. And I need some help. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need some money. And he goes, how much? And I said, lots. <laughs> he goes, give me a number. And OK. I said, well, I think we can get going with a quarter million dollars. That's enough to bring scientists together. Let's see if we can't kickstart with that. What else do you need? I need your Rolodex, because i got to call a lot of people and ask for more money. And he said, done. It was a seven-minute conversation. With that check in hand, things got rolling. And we started writing a white paper. We started organizing. We started calling other genetic scientists and thinking about this paper. We, we talked to editors at journals. And we organized a meeting in New York in May 2016 that got branded as secret. We already knew that putting human in front of genome was going to be provocative for people, particularly when you add synthesis. But when you put secret in front of it, oh my god, it's so good. Scientists don't get any attention. And all of a sudden, we got 100 million page views in 200 different news sources. And suddenly, everyone was talking about the next genome project. So cool. But it wasn't really secret. That's the, I wish it was, but it was published just a few days later. And in fact, we had 135 people at the meeting and they're tweeting. It's not like it's that secret. But the Genome Project right was published. And honestly, I wouldn't have thought in a million years that I'd end up working with these eminent scientists, pushing them to do something like this and getting them to think about this. And again, we created a website around this and started to pull people in and started sharing information. But everyone always asks me, why do this? Come on, we make human genomes all the time. Your genomes were made. We roll some dice in a bedroom, boom, you got a human genome. Why do we need <laughs> to synthesize a human genome? And the fact is, we don't. 
But we are synthesizing viruses and bacteria and reprogramming cells, and there's an entire industry flourishing around this. And we don't have things like standards, ethics, international collaborations. We don't have the networks of scientists working together. We don't have the funding to bring in people and engage them. And we weren't communicating with the public well. Most people had never heard of synthetic biology. This is just an overview of some of the companies that are doing cell reprogramming and synthesis. There's more than I can keep track of today. It's a growing industry worth billions of dollars and probably trillions in the future. We need the tools and the technology and a framework for doing this type of engineering because it's possibly the most powerful and important technology humans have ever created. CRISPR, a gene editing technology, is already being used to do genetic surgeries on human embryos and, and for many other tasks. It's an amazing technology. But what happens when we can synthesize human genomes? Because every time one of our cells divide, a human genome is written. We need to start thinking about this stuff now, today, 10 years early. I'm not too worried about it because this little girl, my daughter, named Rosalind after one of the scientists that was instrumental in discovering the DNA molecule, or we just call her Ro or Roro. Roro was my teacher. She was made in an IVF lab in New York. IVF 40 years ago was pretty controversial. It's not. Today there's five million kids by IVF. And I tell you, if, we, if they end up this way naturally, or if we do a little genetic surgery and they end up this happy, or even if I upgraded her so she didn't get things like cancer or could see in the dark, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> She's teaching me. But there's darker visions, and if you've seen this movie, You've probably touched on some of those visions. It's a great movie, by the way. Go. It's probably the best movie in bioengineering I've seen in 20 years. But here's the truth. Biology is the only sustainable technology that we have. You don't have to mow down a rainforest. You just make the rainforest work for you. It's infinitely scalable. It's not going away. It's been around for four billion years, and it has a simple programming language that is universal. We're adding a billion people every 12 years, still. I think this is the technology that heals our world, meets all of our needs, gives us a better standard of living, cures our diseases. I hope that you learn a little about synthetic biology, I hope you check out the Genome Project right and the amazing people, now over 200 scientists from 100 institutions around the world that are organizing. I welcome you into my world. And when you look back in 10 years, you'll say, he was right. <laughs> Dare to know.